What is up, YouTube? Today we are going to contour breast regional nodal radiation. And this is going to be a post mastectomy case, left sided. Really excited to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is an educational video. This doesn't count as medical advice. So at the end of the day, the decisions that you make are your own. Regional nodal radiation can be quite a challenge. So that, that's why I wanted to focus on it. There are a few key details that you really want to make sure you get correct to minimize the chance of breast cancer recurrence in the patients that you're treating. And before I start from scratch, I want to show you what a final version looks like. So this has all of the main OIRs I'd want to include. And I'm showing our final CTV in red here. At the end of the day, some things that you're going to want to look at, you want to look at what's the inferior extent of your CTV. So in this case, this patient has reconstructed breast. I want to see how far that's going to go a few more millimeters down. I notice that I am on the plane where I have my liver and where I have my stomach. So I do include those OARs in this case. So that's one thing to check. You want to make sure your optimizer is set for success and you can avoid any unnecessary nausea for your patients during treatment because they can be sensitive to even low doses of radiation in the liver and stomach. The next thing that I want to check is sort of my superior edge of my field. So in this case, I included the supraclavicular field and going up the superior edge is when I get to my cricoid cartilage. So hopefully you can see here the cricoid cartilage right here. And I go down to where I see the final itty bitty slice. And then I go one step lower and that's where my supraclavicular field is going to finish. I'm also going to check my level two and three lymph nodes and my level one lymph nodes and see, making sure that those are starting and ending in the right place. So. This is the part of the scapula called the acromion. And this connects to the pectoralis minor muscle. You'll see that this is an important landmark, but I'm going to check that my level two and three lymph nodes end where the pec minor inserts into the acromion process. And I'm going to check that my level one lymph node shown here ends when I see the subclavian vessel crossing over. So I'll go into more of that, but essentially I don't see it crossing over here and then I start to see it cross over here. That's where I stop it. And then lastly, my inferior aspect of my level one lymph nodes is going to be where the fourth and fifth ribs are sideways to the chest wall. There another way to look at that is where the fourth rib inserts into the pec minor. And so that's just kind of my checklist as I'm checking through and making sure my contours look good and ready to go. You will notice that my chest wall contour here shown in yellow is going all the way back to the chest wall. And this is what we recommend in post mastectomy radiation cases. I know sometimes this is an area where people have questions. How far back do I draw my breast or, or chest wall contour? In the post mastectomy setting, these patients are at higher risk of recurrence and you do want to bring your contour all the way back to the chest wall. So behind your pectoralis major and behind your pectoralis minor muscles. You'll see that there's some overlap with your level two and level three lymph nodes. It's a little bit redundant. I've contoured them here just so you can see how they're supposed to look. At the end of the day, whether or not you contour them, as long as you have this, this posterior space covered where you're going to the edge of the chest wall, that's what matters for your patient. And so let's go over some of the other structures, our OARs, and then we'll dive into talking about the target structures themselves. So notice here on the left, I have included my structure set template. 
And I really do recommend that you create an individual structure set template for breast RNI cases. So every breast RNI case, you're going to have the same structures ready for you to contour. There are a lot of structures and it's easy to lose track. Also, it can be slow and cumbersome if they're not organized in a nice way and you're hopping up and down instead of just going through a nice steady checklist. So I have my chest wall and contralateral breast contours next to each other. I have my lung contours together, individual and combined. I have my heart as well as heart substructures all bunched together. And then I have some of my midline OARs like the spinal cord, the esophagus, and the thyroid. And then lastly, I have some ipsilateral structures, including the brachial plexus, the shoulder. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I do check to see what's the inferior aspect of my PTV going to look like. And if it is down to the level of the liver or the stomach, I will include those as OARs. So many of these OARs should be familiar to you, but the ones I'm going to focus on are the ones that we don't routinely contour for other disease sites. And that includes our left ventricle, right ventricle, our left anterior descending artery, and then the shoulder. So the left ventricle and the right ventricle are going to fit within the heart. The left anterior descending artery, I'm going to draw after I do the ventricles. The heart, sometimes it's tricky to tell where is the top of the heart. And, and then the bottom of the heart is usually easier to see, but it's where you see the last strip of pericardium surrounding your ventricles. So for the top of the heart, I'm not going to get into exactly where that is here, but I was, I'll just give a clue that what I care about the most is my left anterior descending artery. And I want to make sure that I'm protecting that. And even in cases when I'm not drawing the LAD, my default heart breast border is going to be where that LAD might begin. And so they say that this is right beneath this vessel, right beneath this arch of the pulmonary artery going here. So this is your landmark, this vessel. And when you get right beneath it, that's usually where you start your heart. And so I'm not going to show contouring the heart, but instead I'm going to focus on drawing my left and right ventricles. As you can see, they're touching each other nicely with no gap in between. And to make this more challenging now, I'm going to delete them and I'll redraw them. I'll also delete the LAD, so I'm not cheating. And let's start with the left ventricle. So now I have the naked heart and what I'm looking for is something that's going to be in this area on the left side that as I go down, eventually is going to swell up, become bigger and bigger. And then eventually it's going to end at the very bottom. I like to start from the top and I like to look for where is there sort of a circle that appears that's then going to continue to get bigger and bigger. That's my left ventricle. So I see it here. This is where I'm going to start. I'm going to continue following it and then here, it's already starting to get hard to tell exactly where it is. I'm going to approximate here and I'll be able to tell if I'm accurate with some interpolation. Here, if you look very closely, you can see a little bit difference in the Hounsfield units between the left side and the right side. And so scrolling up and down can help you see this a little bit better. I can see this difference here. Rolling down, I can see the difference here. See the difference here. And, and you're just going to carry this left ventricle all the way home, all the way to the bottom. Yep. And that is your left ventricle. Now I have the space here that I wasn't as sure about because it, it looks pretty indistinct, but using some of these as guidance, I can continue to follow it. Mm -hmm. 
This takes a little bit of practice. Okay, when you stare at gray long enough, you start to notice a difference in between light gray and slightly light gray. And now I will interpolate. And now I have a reasonable left ventricle. Now I will do the right ventricle. And this is going to be abutting the left ventricle. It's going to start somewhere around here. And, and this is really the hardest part is determining where to start the right ventricle. I do know it's going to end down here alongside the left ventricle. And without belaboring this, I think I can see it around here going higher up. I think this is getting into vessels and I don't think I'm in the ventricle anymore. And it's okay that I'm drawing into the left ventricle because I just want to make sure that they're kissing each other. And I'm going to use a Boolean operation to eliminate the overlap at the end. I'm skipping every couple of slices. And this is my right ventricle. Great. I will interpolate now. And going to erase the overlap. And now I have nice right and left ventricle. Great. So now we get into the last part, which is the LED. And I usually save this for last, but this is the left anterior descending artery. So it's going to be supplying the left ventricle. It's going to be anterior and it's going to work its way down as it descends. Once you see it, and and know where to look for it. it. This becomes easy, but if this is your first time looking for it, it is a little bit tricky. You want to look on the left side and you want to look for a pocket that's surrounded by darkness and where there's a little dot. And if you know it's an LED if you can follow it as it goes down. And so in, in this case, I can see it here. And this is what I'm going to contour as the LED. So let me go ahead and draw this. And it's going to eventually look like it's long and, and pointing inwards as it flattens out. And eventually it's going to get to the, the aortic trunk. And here it's a little bit harder to see, but I know I can see it here. And at this point, it's really blended in. So you start to have the pulmonary arteries and you can't see it. But I know it's going up here. So now let me just continue to track my way down with it. And I'm going to be a little bit generous when I contour this. Because remember, this is an OAR to try to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And as you're trying to protect it, it's okay to contour it a little bit generously. So this is this is my style. Others may have other styles, but the important thing is recognizing where the LED is and being able to contour it as you go down. And you may have some slices where you can't really see it, but then it reappears later on in the slice. In that case, I would contour on the slices where you do see it and then use interpolation to help you fill in the gaps. So at the very end, you should see it nestled kind of nicely in this corner between the ventricles. And I'm going to now interpolate, and you can see I've created this continuous strip of artery, and now looks very nice. And that's how you draw the LAD. And so let's get back to the superior border of the heart. What marks my superior border? Well, essentially I'm looking for where does my LED start? And that's usually what guides me to choose the top slice of my heart. So in this case, I actually might edit the heart just a little bit, take out this slice, maybe even take out this slice. And then this is where my LED starts. And so I just want to make sure that I am protecting it safely. So hopefully the heart is less of a mystery now. I know the substructures can be new. And the other thing that may be new in breast cases is contouring the shoulder as an avoidance structure. 
So this is what the shoulder looks like. It's essentially a one centimeter expansion around the humeral head. And the way that I would contour this, let me just create a dummy structure right now. I would look in all three planes to be sure that I'm centered. Then I'm going to create a sphere that's about the same diameter as my humeral head. And then I'll click and you can see how that's appeared in all three planes. I'll do a one centimeter expansion. I'll call it a left shoulder. And now I have my shoulder, which matches very closely with the other shoulder that I drew. So that's how you create the shoulder. It doesn't have a strict tolerance, but it is an avoidance structure which can help you and help the patient. In addition to the benefits of lower dose to the joint space, this also will help you to prevent dose from going lateral to the acromion process in this area. And why is that actually pretty important? Studies have shown that if you deliver dose lateral to the acromion process in this area, you actually increase the risk of lymphedema. So this shoulder actually is pretty helpful for us to optimize the outcomes for our patient. So now that we've got the shoulder drawn, the only other OAR I wanted to highlight is the brachial plexus, which is in green. And kind of scrolling from bottom to top, we do have a brachial plexus video that you can check out um, and, uh, and see exactly how the brachial plexus is contoured. But I'm just doing my check here. I saw five, um, five roots and double checking here on the sagittal view. I also see my five roots looking very nice here. One, two, three, four, five. So the other OARs you can see, I'll hide the, the target structures. We have the esophagus the thyroid, and the spinal cord. We have not only the ipsilateral lung, but also the contralateral lung and both lungs combined. And I do include the nipple shown here in dark blue, marked by a BB to make sure I'm avoiding a hot spot there. I do include the scars, which are marked by wires. So here you can see the wires that we put on the scar. Those are contoured to help with setup. And I will eventually contour the, the sort of external. And then for skin, for IMRTV map, I use a three millimeter thickness for the skin. Now let's get into the fun stuff. We're going to go into the target starting with the chest wall. Note that we do have the contralateral breast contoured to avoid dose spillage there. The chest wall contour can be deceptively tricky. You're thinking about the superior aspect. Where is that going to be? And the inferior aspect, how low is it going to go? And then also the lateral aspect and the medial aspect. And so you'll notice that I have my wires placed for field borders. These I'm not going to use to strictly guide my contours, but I place them there as a helpful reference and landmark as I'm drawing these to get a rough sense of what I want to accomplish. And you'll notice that my superior wire is actually placed all the way up here. Why is that? Well, I was actually trying to place the wire at the inferior aspect of the clavicle, which you see here on the coronal view that that would have been around here, but it can be difficult when you're palpating through the, through the patient to try to tell where the bones are. Sometimes your wire is placed, not exactly where you were intending to place it. And that's why it's so important to go by the anatomy that you see on your CT scan when you're contouring rather than following the wires that you placed. Similar for the lower border of my breast IMRT contour, I'm not going all the way down to where the wire is. I'm just going down to the area that's at risk where the breast tissue used to exist and where I can see the flap is placed. So that's the superior and inferior orders of the chest wall and you want to follow the CT anatomy that you see, not strictly follow the wires that you've placed. Medially, 
This can be a bit of a debate. What I'm showing here is one style. Others are certainly acceptable. But in this style, we go to the edge of the sternum and we don't feel that there's a great benefit or a need to extend more medially. Now, this might be different. Maybe if the primary tumor was located more medially and you're concerned that this area might be at higher risk. But in this case, we were not worried and we feel safe about marking the medial edge along the sternum. Laterally, we put a wire to mark the mid axilla. Keeping that in mind, ultimately, when we're contouring, we are looking at where is the flap placed and where was the breast and where is the area that was that's actually at risk the most. So that is how we decided on the lateral aspect of the chest wall contour. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the posterior aspect, and this is probably the most important that you want to make sure you're not confusing. For post-mastectomy, you want to take your chest wall contour back all the way to the chest wall. And as I'm, as I'm scrolling down, I, I see that looks very good. And scrolling up, I also see that I'm continuing to do that and I'm safely covering this area that's behind the, the pectoralis muscles. So let's get into a regional lymph nodes now. We have levels one, two, and three axillary nodes. We have the IMNs and we have the supraclavicular nodes. The order that I like to do it and that I find really nice is to do level two, then level three, then level one. After that, I'll do the IMNs, then the supraclavicular nodes. And finally, I'll do some final polishing with everything combined as my CTP. So the level two nodes, these are going to hug your pectoralis minor muscle. And I'm sort of showing what it looks like here. And, and I'll show how to draw these. Your level three nodes are going to be just next to it and medial. And then your level one nodes are going to be here kind of in the armpit space. Now, I don't want to spoil everything, so I'm going to erase my contours and challenge myself to recreate these for you. So I said, we'll begin with level two. And so we're going to begin with level two. For the level two nodes, this essentially just hugs the pectoralis minor muscle. And this is following the RADCOMP atlas, which was designed for IMRT and VMAT for plans that are meant to be conformal. In the RADCOMP atlas, you'll see that it says to cover the fat space around the pectoralis minor muscle. Hopefully you can see the pectoralis minor muscle here. And I'm going to go to the first level where I can start to reasonably see fat space between the pec major and the pec minor. And the fat space is the dark stuff. So I think this is a reasonable level because below there's not a lot of space here. Exactly where I start doesn't matter so much because I contoured a very nice sort of comprehensive chest wall contour. And you see even below this, this space is still covered by my chest wall contour. So I'm just going to focus on the pec minor muscle now and just, just hug it with the level two. And I, I go to the medial aspect and I go to the lateral aspect and I go up to where the pec major is. Same thing here. This is where the level two is. Yeah. Also covering rotters nodes. It's a bit of trivia. And then just continuing level two lymph nodes. So hopefully this process seems a little less intimidating now. For level two, where you start, you just have to follow the pectoralis minor muscle and you just have to hug it from bottom to top. Notice here, I am continuing my line straight down along here. And that's what you're going to want to start seeing when you get higher up. So for instance, here again, just going to the lateral edge of the pec minor. 
and you start to see this. And then being diligent to cover all the fat space, go up two slices, continue. And now I'm, I'm finally getting into this crevice here. This is what you want to start seeing. As you go straight down, you'll get into this little corner. That's good. That's what you want to be seeing. And I'll just continue covering my little two lymph nodes. And you see these gray things here. I'm not letting those distract me. I'm keeping my eye on the prize. I'm just following the pec minor muscle. I am not overcomplicating things. And these structures, I do want to end up contouring in the end. I'm just keeping it very simple and just continuing to just hug my pec minor muscle. And so we're nearing the end of our nice tour with this pec minor muscle and our tour ends when we finally reach the chromium process. So hopefully you can see here, this is the tiny thin remnant of our pec minor muscle where it's finally reached and inserting into our chromium process. So that's where we stop. And then I'm going to interpolate and we have our level two lymph nodes done. Next are the level three lymph nodes. So I'm going to start these at the same level where I began my level two lymph nodes. Again, exactly where I start doesn't matter so much in this case because my chest wall contour is including the areas below it. But level three is just the neighbor of level two. And it just goes up, filling in the fat space, and eventually will start to look a little bit longer as you have this medial fat space to cover as well. Great, so level three is pretty straightforward. You're just filling in the, the dark area that you see that's inside to your level two. And you keep going up. Do you know where level three ends? Level three is going to end same place where level two ends. So you don't even really need to think about it. You just draw until you don't see any level two slices anymore. And then that's when you know that you've reached. Okay, so this is going to be our last slice in level three. It's been a wonderful journey. And thank you, Mr. Level Three. We will interpolate. And now this is kind of what our level three contours look like. Here, I maybe got a little bit aggressive, skimming into this space here. If I hide the chest wall, you can, you can see this plane a little bit more, but this is a, this is a very small detail probably doesn't matter, but just wanted to show you what a nice level three looks like. There we go. Okay. Great. And last but not least of our axillary nodes, we do level one. So level one, where does it start at the bottom? Remember we said starts where the fourth and the fifth ribs are sideways. So just counting the ribs down, this is rib one, two, three, four. And so now this is four ribs sideways and five ribs sideways. And so this is where I'm going to want to start my level one lip node contouring. Zoom in just a little bit. And I want to hug the chest wall. I want to fill in the space around the muscles here. And then I want to go about this far outside where I can see kind of a nice line between the edge of the muscle and heading sort of diagonally forward. What you don't need to do is go all the way to the outside edge of the muscle. You just need to cover sort of the front edge. 
So this is what you want to be targeting. And again, what you don't, we're not doing any of this. This, this is, this is too much and you know, there is no big benefit with that. So just keeping it nice and tight. And then we're, our anterior aspect is where our chest wall or in cases where the intact breast, where the breast contour is. And so level one is just staying in bounds, not doing anything too fancy. And level one will continue up. And you see, I'm really going right along the muscle. I'm being pretty meticulous there. So the next question is, how high up do you draw level one? And I'll tell you, it has to do with vascular anatomy with the Radcomp Atlas. So we're actually not looking at bony anatomy for this superior marker. We, we, we want to make sure it doesn't go up to the humeral head. Before the humeral head, we actually are going to see something. What we're going to see is we're going to see the vessels crossing the street. And so once the vessels start to cross the street, you need to stop and you need to let the vessels pass. And then actually you will never continue again. So what vessels do I speak of? I'm actually talking about this guy. And here you see the vessels crossing sort of the line that I drew for level two. So here it's okay to draw your level one. Here is the first slice where it begins to cross. That's okay. But once it's now crossing, you stop. And, and you don't keep up. So that's, that's where the end of level one is. And look here on the sagittal view. We are stopping a ways below the humeral head. So we're not necessarily going all the way up to the inferior aspect of the head of the humerus. And this is the coronal view. And so the last thing that I would check, and I don't have this on this scan, but for extra credit and actually what I would recommend if your patient had pre-op imaging. But let's say they had a PET CT scan. And let, let's say they were candidate for new adjuvant chemotherapy and had a pre chemo scan that you got to look at. You want to look at the earliest scan where it's showing the most gross disease. And then you want to check is your nodal contouring including the area where there was any gross nodal disease? So imagine I'm reviewing an old PET CT scan and I see up around this area that there was in fact a node that was out here. In that case, I would want to extend my CTV to make sure I'm covering where the node was. Okay. This is a pro tip and it's something that you should check to make sure that your nodal contours are, are perfect final before you approve them. You want to check to make sure we're covering any areas where there used to be gross disease. I'm not doing that here because I don't have a PET CT scan, but that is what I would recommend. And I will interpolate. And so now to make everything look a little bit extra neater, I'm going to make level two a hard structure. And I'm just going to do a shortcut Boolean operation to subtract levels three and level one from the hard structure. And now I have this beautiful looking levels one, two, and three. Let's move on to the internal memory node. So the key here is recognizing where is the internal memory artery? Where, where do the internal memory vessels course? Because it's easy to kind of just guess where to draw, but once you know actually where the vessel is, you can be certain that you're contouring the right space. First thing, the internal memory nodes, as we go down, they're going to occupy the space right next to the sternum and in between the first rib that you see. So always it's going to be the space next to the sternum. We are never looking at this, these spaces out here in between the ribs. That is the wrong place to look. Second is that we need to make sure we're covering the right spaces. So for the Radcop Atlas, you want to cover down to the intercostal space between the third and the fourth rib. And that's the last space that you are contouring. Now, if someone had IMN nodal involvement, then you may want to cover further than that. But for someone without IMN involvement, you would typically contour down to between the third and fourth ribs space. So how are we going to find this? I'm going to first find the first rib 
So here I'm looking at my axial view here and I see the first rib and I'm going to follow this and see where does it connect. So it's, it's connecting right here and now I'm looking at the coronal view. So this is my first rib and then scrolling down, this is my second rib and this is my third rib. You can see it better on the other side, but this is my third rib. We'll, we'll talk about why it looks like there are a bunch of calcifications here, that those are actually clips. And then the fourth rib is here. So I will mark this because this can be very tricky. This rib space that I want to contour, I'm going to put a big marker here just so I can know that I'm in the right final rib space. And now I'm going to forget about that for a little bit and I'm going to go to finding where the vessel starts. So I want you to look with your own eyes right now as I scroll up and down and see if you can see where the vessel is, the internal mammary artery. And then I'm going to show you where it is. So at this point, you're either seeing it or you're not seeing it. And if you're not seeing it, it might be that no one has ever showed you this before. But to find the vessel, you look for where is there a wart going into the lung. And so if you see this, this little wart here, this is our vessel. And it's and it always is going to look like a little wart that's protruding into the lung. And once you found it, it's it's amazing. It's like a it's like an aha moment. And you can just follow this, and that is your IMN vessels. And it's it's really, really satisfying to find this. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and I want to go at least a five millimeter margin around the vessel. And I would say early on I used to think that how the vessel got from here to here was just magic. Somehow it would just like dive through the bone. But now I see that there's no magic to it. It's actually just very slyly skimming, skimming along here. And so hopefully you can see this as it skims and makes its way into the space. I'm making sure I have a five millimeter margin. And what your IMN contours are going to want to look like are flat pancakes. Why, why do we shape them like this? This is also based on patterns for where cancer came back, where it recurred. And they found that sometimes it would happen just sideways to the vessel. So not only do we contour the vessel, but we contour side to side around it with at least a five millimeter margin. And it's going to look nice and flat like this. You can carp out the lung and carp out the bone, the cartilage. But you have these nice five millimeter margin on each side to make your IMN pancakes. Great. And so I'm just following these down and like, whoa, what's going on here? So this is not bone. These are actually clips that the surgeon placed. Why would a surgeon be placing clips here? Well, remember this patient had a deep flap, D-I-E-P flap. And so this flap needs a blood supply. And they actually connect the flap to the blood supply in the internal mammary artery. And so this is actually clips from the anastomosis that they made connecting the flap to the internal mammary artery. And it makes sense that it's in the IMN space where you're contouring around the vessels. So this should be assurance that you're in the right space. Regardless, you want to cover these clips because they were involved in the surgical field, part of the surgical bed. And so you want to make sure you're covering the clips. And I've, I've gotten to my, my green handy dandy reference structure, which is telling me I've arrived at my last intercostal space. No more stops beyond this. Please be prepared to exit the doors that open on either side. And this is the last part where I'm still seeing the vessel here before I'm going to say goodbye. And just to check here on the coronal view, I have successfully gone down to the fourth rib, which I know I marked because I put this landmark here when I was counting the ribs in the beginning. I'm going to interpolate. And now I can see nicely the IMN nodes. This is what they should look like. 
I'll zoom out just a little bit. Okay, great. So those are the IMNs. And next, last but not least, we have the supraclavicular nodes. And so these start right where the IMNs left off. You're going to go to the top slice of your IMN, and this is where you start drawing your supraclavicular field. And it, it goes all the way to the lung. At the inferior edge, you can be a little bit less aggressive. You may not need to actually contour all this far down, but you do want to go up forward to the clavicle and you do want to extend to the side all the way, making sure you're covering the lung. So the medial aspect of the supraclavicular field is the medial aspect of the common carotid artery. This should remind you of head and neck contouring, very similar to when you're drawing your level four contours. And so you, you notice here, this is one aspect that I'm being very precise. This gray structure I'm not including because this is actually my anterior scalene muscle. You know, one of my landmarks for my brachial plexus, but it's a muscle and it's not part of my actual target. And so I'm going to just contour around it. And you have to imagine there is a thin space where it connects to your level three lymph node area. And then the other thing that I should do that I'm not doing right now is I should turn on my OARs to make sure I'm not going into my esophagus or my thyroid. And as I said, this is going to the back. Great. So these are your supraclavicular nodes. I'm down to make sure I'm accurate. And so I'm going to leave this posterior triangle a little bit in suspense. We're going to go back to it. But for now, let's just focus on how high up do I bring the supraclavicular nodes? I'm going to go up until I get to, do you know it? Until I get to my inferior aspect of the cricoid cartilage. That was one of the landmarks I mentioned at the beginning, which marks the very top. So this is the cricoid cartilage. And then... Here, I'm just going to the very last spike I see, and then one slice below. So this is the right slice to end that. And I'm going to turn my attention to the posterior triangle. So the Radcop Atlas does include this space in their contours. The reason is that when we started doing IMRT and VMAT planning, we started to notice that we actually were having failures here. This was an area of recurrence. And we didn't realize that that was such an important area to cover. When we used to do 2D or 3D fields, we would do an on FOSS field to cover the supraclavicular area. And then this area got dose just by chance as the field went through all the way. Now, when we switched to IMRT and 3D, we started to see, oh my gosh, by not contouring this, we're actually starting to have failures here. So we realized that this posterior triangle is an important area to contour. This is how you complete the triangle and the borders. This is a little bit of muscle review and I even have a piece of paper here to make sure I don't mess this up. This is our longus coli. This is our trapezius muscle posteriorly. And then we have our platysma laterally. And so the posterior triangle is going to connect to your level two and three lymph nodes. And exactly where you start is a bit of a judgment call. It should start to look triangular. I guess that's one clue. And then as I interpolate and then scroll up and down, we can see how this structure looks. I'm going to edit this just a little bit to carve out of any muscle that's unnecessary. And then I'm going to smooth just a few times. Right. So here I have my, my scaling muscle that I wanted to exclude. Look how nice that looks. So that is our supraclavicular field with the posterior triangle. 
The decision to include the posterior triangle is up to the clinician. Generally, though, if it's a patient that you would have done a 3D on FOSS superclav field, that would be the time where you want to make sure you're including your posterior triangle. Great. So we've done uh, level two, level three, level one, IMNs, superclavicular. Let's take a moment to celebrate and just wrap this up with the CTV. So I'm combining all of these structures along with my chest wall CTV and making a final CTV, assuming these are all going to get the same dose. I'll make this red, uh, actually crimson, go crimson. And now is just my time for final, final review. This is a bit of an art. My purpose for polishing this at the end is simply to make the job of my dosimetrist or medical physicist easier and better. So I'm going to try to make sure that what I draw is a smooth, continuous structure without gaps because it's going to be easier for them to do IMRT and DMAT optimization working with a structure that is one smooth, continuous structure rather than working with structures that have islands or different pieces to them. So this would be one example where I'm connecting the islands and this is going to help out my planners. The other major area where I'm going to be connecting the island is down when I get to my IMNs. And I'll show you, this is what I mean. This, this isn't crazy if you think about it, the breast cancer, what route does it take to spread to the IMNs? It's, it's going along this way. But the main goal of doing this is to simply create a, a single smooth continuous structure that will be easier for my physicist and dosimetrist team to plan. And please keep in mind that this is kind of an optional step and by no means is this standard, but this is what we do in our practice. And we have found this beneficial for us developing more efficient and higher quality plans for our patient. So you, you may like this little trick. I think your physicist or dosimetrist will thank you when you're trying to optimize the structure of it as one smooth, continuous thing, rather than trying to optimize this where you have an island here. That's more challenging for them to do. And is this significantly changing the clinical toxicity of what treatment I'm giving? I would say no, because either way, I'm going to be doing a PTV expansion. And these islands that are very close are going to end up very close to each other. And there might be just a tiny sliver in between that's not contoured as PTV. But you're not going to be able to spare that sliver. And it's not clinically meaningful in this area to try to spare that. So I think the benefits are strong and the changes it has in the clinical aspects of the plan are minimal. And so we just do this and we keep going down and you go down all the way. This is how I do it. There may be a more efficient way to do this. So feel free to write in the comments. <laughs> and again, this is not, there's no one perfect way to do contouring, but this is an acceptable, an acceptable and a good way to accomplish RNI contouring for your patient. I'm not going to talk about PTV expansions here because that gets a little dicey. Different centers have, have different policies. So just focusing on the CTV contouring. Hopefully you found this video helpful and would love to know if, if you found this helpful. Um, I'll post a little description of what you can do if you want to support more work like this in the future. And it's been fun making this for you guys. So we're at the end and turning everything on now. This is breast regional nodal radiation contouring, and you are ready to go out there and do a great job.